Good afternoon and welcome to Robbing Minds. My name is Isabella Adediji. It was hoped that when this administration last year under President Bola Metinubu announced the removal of subsidy on PMS, that the fuel queues will come to a permanent end. Alas, it's been weeks now. Nigerians have had to grapple with fuel queues and increased costs despite the removal of subsidy. A lot of questions are in the air as we now have a refinery making petrol available to Nigerians, refining here in Nigeria. Does this affect the price of petrol? Does it mean we're going to have an end to the queues? A lot of questions. Nigerians need answers as this has affected the cost of transportation, goods and services amongst record high levels of inflation. To discuss this fuel scarcity, the potential of local refining in Nigeria, and much more, I have with me a policy, research, and development expert in the person of Israel Fawali. Israel, welcome to Robin Mike. Yeah, thank you so much, Isabella. Thank you. It's good to be here again. Um, I think the, the first question I'm going to ask is something that Nigerians tend to ask these days, how much did you buy petrol for, whether it's for your car or for your generator? Oh, okay. So I think it depends on location. In my location in Ibadan, we are buying fuel for 1,200 naira. 1,200. Have you had any chance of buying petrol here in Lagos? Uh, no. Okay. 1,200 naira. Now, if you go online and if you go to some of the petrol stations here in Lagos, you'd see 855, 895. Wow. And let's not talk about black markets going as high as 2,000 naira. I think the biggest question is, why do these fuel queues still linger? What's the problem? Oh, okay, so I think uh, one of the major problems why the fuel queue still lingers in Nigeria, but as around our over-reliance on import, importation of, um, of fuel, that is one of the reasons why I feel that, um, you know, the uh, fuel queues is going to co continue to linger for a very long time. Another reason I feel... There's going to be continuous fuel, 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 fuel queues in Nigeria is if the government refuses to invest enough in local refinery capabilities. If we don't have local refinery capabilities, we are going to continue to spend a lot of money importing, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, um, uh, fuel. And that is, you know, itself, you know, a damage to our economy. So there's going to be continued queue until we start local production in Nigeria before some of and we can also have control over the prices before some of these queues in Nigeria, you know, would um, would release, we will reduce. So you're confident that with local refineries, we would have reduced prices. And why is that so when a lot of the transactions still happen in dollars and right now the market is free. So if it is cheaper to import, will marketers still feel a need to buy locally once our refineries are up. Okay, so I feel that you know the import cost is a big, you know, amount of money on its own. And when that is no longer there, I feel marketers would not have any excuse to, for for them to give you know high prices on fuel, you know, prices in the country. So that's why I feel that once we start producing, refining, you know, fuel that we we use within the country, the transport, the import cost would reduce, and that would apparently also you know impact the prices of of fuel in Nigeria. And, and what are some of the effects of this lingering queues? Um, how does it affect everybody? How does it affect businesses? Because I think um, it's, it's nice that we're sitting down here and we're saying 1,200, but it seems like Nigerians are just going on and on, like they're just adapting. But what's the long-term effect of this? Oh, it's, it's so much. And where do I start from? Um, inflation is one of the things. When there is increase in fuel price, you see the price of services, the price of goods, apparently gets you know increased over time. And this also you know has its cascade effect on Nigerians. Buying power will be reduced because there is serious inflation, right? Earning power also is not increasing. It reduces buying power again. There is you know is it has its very serious effect. Like I said, buying power is going to increase. Pro output uh, capacity, productivity of companies too, either large scale company or small scale, is also going to reduce, and this would, you know, we, we, cost price would increase, and this will result in, you know, uh, uh, cu cutting down of, you know, their services. For example, you know, either sacking of workers or retren retrenching workers, 
and also cutting down on their output as well. So this is going to affect, you know, it affects us, you know, all around because people will lose their job. They get back into the market looking for means to get, you know, means for their livelihood. So uh, it has a, a, it has a lot of serious, you know, effect. We want to talk about the impact on health as well. It has its relationship with our, what do you call it? So it, it's, a, it's a form of social determinant of health. Because when people are, people are not earning any better and good, you know, the quality of life also in, it reduces. And of course, over the time, is also telling on the health. And of course, there is a relationship between work and health. So these are, you know, cascade effect that comes with, you know, continuous kills, continuous uh, inflation in fuel prices in Nigeria. Now, earlier on, one of the solutions you said is that local refineries. Like if we have local refineries that are making this product available, we don't have to spend so much on importing. Right. Now, how confident are you in our local refineries, be it private or um, public refineries? Okay, so my confidence, I, I can't say I have 100% confidence, but I can't say if the government is serious and genuine, the government knows that they must put in place friendly policies, either for government of, 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 of private uh, uh, refineries, there must be friendly policies, that reg rather than regulatory policies or price policies that makes you know, the, the production environment, the business environment suitable for both the government setting and private setting. So it is not all dependent on either we have re refineries or not. It also depends on the policies that government puts in place to make life easy, to make operational uh, uh, processes, you know, easy for these refineries. Either they are government, like I said, or either they are privately owned. What are other solutions beyond the refineries? Because it does take time before um, the local refineries are able to meet the demand. And we know that we rely on PMS for a lot of things, whether right. it's powering generators right. or our cars. Now, um, what are other solutions that the government can introduce in the short term to sort of attack this issue because it has so many effects, like cascading effects. What should the government be doing now? So right now, we know that there is serious inflation. Tax breaks are very, very important. There should be tax breaks. The government also should incentive, create serious form of incentives for government workers. I mean, we've seen some state government that says, oh, okay, my workers, instead of coming to work for five days, work from home, come only two days. Some are saying come three days. So these are some of, you know, things I feel, policies I feel, would actually really reduce the cascade effect, you know, of this uh, 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 problem. So the government should, you know, be empathetic enough to understand that, yes, there is high cost of fuel. People don't get, if I see people in Ibano, for example, now on skateboards, rolling bicycles, and you see people in the neighborhood who saying, yeah, Mr. Labaja, are you going to work tomorrow? Please, I'll join you. I'll pack my fuel, but I'll be going on Friday so you don't have to carry your car. So people are appearing also looking for alternatives. So what the government needs to do is to be sensitive to the sensibilities of people. Yeah, giving incentive tax breaks are very, very important. Periodic in incentives are very important that we cannot emphasize in a time like this when there is problems. Incentives such as, you know, food in incentive, because this kind of problem that we have also have serious cascade effects on our food security. And these are serious problems that the government cannot afford, you know, to entertain because it is just a primary issue that will keep bringing another secondary issue. And from there, we have another. So other things that I feel the government should invent, uh, invest heavily in is renewable energy, clean energy. You know, solar panels should be, you know, given to people at subsidized rates, either at mortgage prices that people can pay for a very long time. So those are some of the things I feel the government should put in place. Clean energy incentives, you know, are some of the alternatives that the government can immediately put in place to mitigate the effects of the fair queues and, you know, fair uh, prices that is currently skyrocketing. And, and how long do Nigerians have to wait to see some of the benefits or the promised rewards of this removal of subsidy? And I think the final question will be, um, we've seen the price of oil increase from 600 and around the 600 mark to about 800 mark, depending on where you are in Nigeria, because we know that beyond Lagos, it gets more expensive. Are we expecting increased prices or is this the end? Or maybe we'll start to see reduced prices. So if the government is not proactive, I mean, we have seen worse. I, want to, I don't want to believe there is there's still anything worse than what we are currently seeing. But if the government is not proactive enough, I can tell you categorically that we are still going to see the extreme worse. We are at the worst now. Nobody had, would have ever imagined from 87 era or from 20 to 16 era 
not 87 naira to 120 naira we are now buying fuel for 1200 so if the government is not proactive enough and what are the proactive measures that the government to, should do investing heavily in local refinery capa capabilities either for private organizations or public organizations there would be serious problems also the government must as a matter of urgency invest invest in alternative energy source you know for the people if there are no alternative and we keep you know over our we keep up with our over dependence on you know importing of uh, fuel uh, what do you call it importation of fuels there is going to be continuous problems and of course if care is not taking we'll start buying you know a liter of fuel for three thousand naira well, we hope that we won't have to buy a little of, uh, of fuel also, for 3,000 naira. Uh, that, that will really uh, skyrocket. But, really um, thank you very much, Israel Fawale, uh, policy, research and development expert for thank your you contributions so thank you so much. here on Robbing Minds. Thank you so much. We'll now go on a quick break on Robbing Minds. Don't go anywhere. Don't just stand and teasing me. Now it's time to show and Our conversation moves to the State of the Nation 2024 right here in Nigeria. Joining me for this conversation is musician and activist Sheon Kuti. Welcome to Robin Minds. Thanks for having me, Sabella. And we also have a human rights lawyer in the person of Festus Ogo. Thank you very much. For Welcome, having me. Festus. Thank you for having me. It's interesting. We have an activist and a human rights lawyer. And the first question that comes to mind is where does it where does the line have to be drawn between a peaceful protest and treason? Is that now blurred? Because Nigerians are asking questions that how does someone coming out to protest somehow end up being charged with treason? So I'd like you, Festus, to take that. To start with, um, protest in Nigeria is a fundamental right. Section 39, 40, and 41 of the Constitution is very clear that to exercise your right to complain as a citizen of this country is given a fundamental right. There is no relationship between exercising the right to protest and treason. Treason is forcefully taking over the control of governmental machinery or taking over the control of the system. But asking for a better government, asking that you are tired of the, you know, way and manner the government is being run, cannot and should not be close to treason. It's just like day and darkness, day and light. You know, treason is a crime. Protest is a right. So there is no way they are in any way connected. They are not connected in any way. Sean, do you feel that considering what has happened in the past week, that um, it's clear cut what treason is and what peaceful protest is? And do you feel at any point um, the protesters moved over to being um, guilty of a crime? <laughs> no, I, I've not seen any crime being committed by the people. The only crime constantly, you know, is that committed by the elites and uh, both political and business against the Nigerian people. That is what should be treasonous, you know. Um, and we as Nigerians must understand class consciousness. You know, when you call me an activist, I was like, eh, because I believe I'm truly a revolutionary. You know, I'm looking to really change this country, not uh, reform it, but to really change the system because we have to be class conscious to understand that we as the people, the working class, the poor people, we are different from the rich people. The social contract of this country that they say we were running since 1999 is that these rich people will take all the resources, all the opportunities, every government incentive goes to them. And from this largesse, they will in turn invest in the economy in the infrastructure, in society at large, in our education, in our healthcare, that they will bring it to the reach of the common man. Even if it is private, they will pay him the wage he needs to access those services. But they've never employed enough people to be able to afford the few that they've built, and they've not even made the wage livable so that we can afford these services. So this is the failure, this is the treason it's in itself that nobody talks about. So when they say there's treason, it's the way they run politics, you know, like the way we can express loyalty for uh, Fubara, and that one is refusing to respect him. He, he's a traitor. So since you don't bow down and the people come outside to speak against them, the people are definitely traitors. Not traitors to Nigeria, but traitors to the individuals that have privatized our public institutions. 
Now, I'm going to move to you, Festus, and um, are Nigerians right in their demands for good governance and these things that um, that Shewon has mentioned? Um, because this government promises renewed hope, and they've said that some of these painful decisions need to be taken now in order for us to benefit from the better infrastructure, the jobs, the opportunities to live, earn a good wage. So and should Nigerians be patient and wait for these um, dividends of democracy to yield, or should we be looking to protest? When a government has failed in its primary responsibility to protect the life of the people and provide basic amenities for them, why should the people be quiet? I believe that protest at any time is justified in this country. It is even more justified because in spite of the 10-day protest that we held last month, the government has not learned any lesson. Was it not last week that the government charged 10 of the protesters to court for treason? The same government of Nigeria was charging them to court for demanding an end to bad governance. It's in, it's in the charge, clearly. Charging protesters to court for demanding an end to bad governance. You are charging protesters to court for simply asking that Tinubu must go. They said that is a crime. When a government elected over a year has failed abysmally, why should the people not demand that you should leave office? That is the question we are asking ourselves. Why should the people not demand? So a government that criminalizes complaints of its citizens do not have the right to tell the citizen to be patient. Because the government has never been patient in spending recklessly. You want our people to be patient, but you have close to 50 ministers. You have, want our people to be patient. There is no reduction in the cost of government. Reckless spending here and there. Those that have held our country to ransom by the failure to deliver the dividend of democracy do not have that right to ask our people to be patient. So I believe strongly that the Nigerian government does not listen to the Nigerian people. The only language that the government of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu understands is protest. If you be, we are speaking English on TV, they will not listen to us. That's the truth. You write on newspaper, they will not listen. You rant on social media, they will not listen. But when you take your placard out there to say you want to protest, you see they begin to hold emergency meeting. The emergency meeting they have failed to hold in in few weeks now. They've not held any emergency. But the day Nigeria come out to say, look, we are tired of this suffering. We are tired of queuing in a country that produces that you know has abundance of oil. We are tired of killing, we are tired of suffering, we are tired of the whole pain and hardship. You see that they begin to panic. So it appears to me that the only language the Nigerian government understands is protest. And if that is the language they understand, I think we should speak loudly to their hearing. Sean, is that the language we should be speaking? Should protest become a regular form of communication with this government? Or should we explore other means, like Festus has said, like speaking here on TV, writing, engaging... Um, writing in the newspapers, is, 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 pro, is protesting enough and will it get the ears of the people who lead us? I, I'm going to paraphrase Martin Luther King. I'm not sure exactly how you said it, but he said something like, I would rather live in a war zone, right, that is just, than live in a peaceful place where there are no rights. Because there's nothing more peaceful than an unjust society where everybody have accepted their fate. They have accepted to be oppressed. So they keep quiet. So the oppressors can just do what they like. I mean, up to 10 years ago, Nigerians were the most resilient people in the world. They were telling us, giving us polls of how we are the happiest people in the world. Nobody came to give us a word for it. But now that we want to start speaking up, for the betterment of ourselves. We are being charged and called. But what I would say to Nigerians, though, protest is not enough, as he said. I see protest as, you know, a child to a loving parent. 
complaining. Oh, daddy, mommy, I don't want to eat this. And the mommy, because he cares, and the daddy and mommy cares. But these people don't care. You know, that's why I don't preach protest only. I also preach mass organization. Because we, the people, must also organize ourselves for power. It is not enough that we are protesting that we don't like what they do. We must also be sending the signals that we are ready to replace them, not with another version of themselves as we did before, from PDP to APC, but with a new people's movement, powered by the people, with workers from, uh, with um, um, representatives from our side of the divide, from the working people, from the poor people, to rule this country for our own benefit. So it's not enough that people even want to protest. Protest is the beginning of this dance, you know? The real party starts when we begin to mass mobilize, and mass organize into a socialist identity to release this country from this capitalist nonsense that we're experiencing. I mean, look at what we are going through in Nigeria today, and they are releasing pictures of our executives in Central Bay. It's all over the social media, all of them enjoying their life at this period in time of the country. You know, so it shows that we are not in the same reality. Nobody, these people, although they are saying hey, we are all for sacrifice. And even to the president, I will say, the fact that he says that these decisions he's making are tough decisions is also a misnomer. It's propaganda. You know, it is well oiled, you know, and it is for the professionals, you know, the journalists to help them spin this nonsense that is going on, you know, because to be tough, right, means to compete or challenge your equals, right? That's, if you are beating your child, that doesn't make you tough. But when you fight your mate, eh, hey, that's toughness, right? To beat your child is wicked. So to keep suffering on Nigerian people, on poor people, on the workers, on the masses of the citizenry, is not being tough. To have been tough with this oil situation was to say, okay, we want to get to the bottom of the subsidy regime. We want to see why it did not work. When he tackles people in his own class and brings them to book, this oil situation would have been solved if that was the route we went through. You know, but instead, he decided to be wicked and they call wickedness toughness. No, I want to see a president that is tough in this country. I truly want to see a tough president that can truly stand up, straighten his spine and face the true issues of this country. I want to see that tough president, but it doesn't exist today. Nobody should be saying this wickedness. Is toughness. No. This renewed hope that you said before, I'm going to tell you no, is renewed scope, mm. as we say on the streets. Uh, Festus, I want to ask you that um, Nigerians now are saying when? When do we have the answers? How long should Nigerians wait for those answers? For And, and I want to also um, lean into what um, Sean just said about mass organization. Is this a wake-up call for 2027 or we still have some time before 2027 to see if indeed it's renewed hope or renewed scope? Well, I think it's a case of renewed hopelessness. I've looked at this administration carefully. I am afraid that the president may not have what it takes to take Nigeria out of the door. Not just that. It also appears to me that the president Apart from being completely incompetent, the, comp the president equally does not believe in basic democratic ideals. You are telling the people to be patient. You are saying, look, our people, please have hope in me. But over a year, we are not seeing any signal that this country is heading towards a right destination. But Again, we cannot blame the president because if anyone gets power illegitimately, it is very difficult for such a person to deliver the dividend of democracy or to do anything meaningful with it. What I have seen playing out is that the president does not understand the solution to Nigeria's problem. Our people are suffering. My brother, sorry I've, to cut you. I beg to differ. But very well. Go on. I believe, that is my belief, that the, the president of Nigeria and the people surrounding him, they do not have the capacity 
to take our people out of Israel. And the reason is very simple. They profit from the inefficiency of the system. The way the country is not governed properly, it profits them. We have a country where corruption and impunity reign supreme. It profits the ruling elite at the expense of the poor. But because they do not feel the pulse of our people, they continue their, their reign in power. Uh, That's the way I see sure, it. You said you disagree, and I, I want to know um, whether we can give this government till 2027, or in this mass organization, are you saying that um, more people need to set up political parties, there needs to be sensitization? Because at this point, Nigerians just want so, a solution, a messiah of we, sorts to deliver them. No, no president, no messiah can deliver Nigerian people. That's one, one thing we must understand. Only the Nigerian people can deliver Nigeria. You see, one of the things, you know, we are 25 years too late already, 1999 to 2025, that we don't have a people's, pro-people's party already with a socialist ideology to share the resources of this country evenly and justly. Equitably, not evenly, equitably. The relationship between Nigerians, our elites, and our resources has to change. That is the bottom line, you know, of this um, argument here. You know, when my brother here was saying, you know, they don't have this, you know, the president of this country today, I've said it before and I'll say it again, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, is one of the men, when I was young, in my teenage years, that inspired my political consciousness. With my uncle, Dr. Beko, these were the king, kingpins of Nadeko. You know, these were the pro-democracy men that we look up to, Uncle Wale Shoinka, the words that they spoke. So even if this president is saying today that, saying the president must go after one year's treason, in 2012, it was part of a protest I was a part of, that we were calling for Jonathan to leave one year to into his uh, reign. Abi? So... The issue that we Nigerian people must understand is that these people know what to do. They don't care about doing it. We must understand that fact first. We must not see what is happening as a mistake, a trial and error. Mm -mm. Because many of us are raised with the win or lose mentality. We don't understand that we are in a life or death situation. We are busy trying to win and crying when we lose. You understand? But this is a life or death situation. So we go to school, and it is a shame and a tragedy that we have to be educated by our elites, you know. And the job of every elite, everywhere in the world, is not wrong, is to put their spirits in the youth. The Chinese educational system, that's what it does, is the vision, ambition, and experience of the elders, of the elites that is taught in the schools what we need for our country to move. That spirit is put into the education. So it is the spirit of our elites that is put into our education here. You know, so it is linked directly to making money. Competition. I'm better than you. Compete, test, all this one. Don't look at my book. All these things that we do. Let me not go into this on that thing entirely. But it brings out the individual lawyer that thinks, oh, I'm a lawyer to make money. The doctor, oh, I'm a doctor to be rich. A musician, I want to sing song to be rich. Everybody just wants to be rich with them. We don't understand that national development cannot be divorced from national talent. So when the education has divorced national talent from national development, that is where we find ourselves. So everybody is easily bought and sold to anything that we think we want to do for our own personal benefit. We don't believe that our talent is needed for the development of our nation, that we must engage. People will laugh at you. What difference will it make? The difference is that you have done something. You know? So we have to be the one to organize around this new ideology, understanding that it is not through competition. Yes. It's okay. But we need cooperation. Because they lie to us. They can tell us every day, hey, don't uh, competition, uh, survival of the fittest, capitalism. But when you work in their companies, they'll tell you cooperate. They don't tell their workers to compete among themselves in the company. It's just when they say tribalism in Nigeria. When it's time to do national work, that's when I hear tribalism. Because I know in all these banks, they have people from all over Nigeria working in there. They, and they, even the national teams, I mean, we have a representation of different tribes that are, you know, um, competing under the Nigerian flag. I'm going to move to you, Festus, and I think the question is, 
what should Nigerians be doing now? Um, I mean, we've tried the protest. There's been announcement that's another protest coming. Shion has said that it's not enough to protest. It's Absolutely. just one, one Absolutely. form. But Nigerians Absolutely. that do feel helpless, like, what can I do? Like Shion said, um, what's that thing you can do and know that you've done something to move this country forward? I would say this very clearly, that you cannot have a revolution on behalf of and ignorant people. What the Nigerian political elite have done is to weaponize ignorance and weaponize poverty. Now, we have a duty as conscious people to conscientize the rest of us, to awaken their consciousness. That is the first thing we need to do. And that has to do with conscientizing them, mobilizing them, awakening their consciousness. Because I was somewhere yesterday, someone was still talking, you know, making excuses for the government, giving me reasons why the government of President Bola Metunubu is trying his best. These people do not essentially understand. And because ignorance has been weaponized, we, the middle class, <laughs> we have that responsibility <laughs> to conscientize the rest of us. And when our people are highly conscientized, they understand the issues. They see reasons why their voice is powerful, why they have to use their voice. Then we can now move towards a political change. What we need in Nigeria is political change. Nigeria is unlikely to move forward with the crop of leadership that we have now. But we cannot never necessarily take away those leaders unless and until we have a conscious citizenry and that is the work we have to do and we've been doing it mm. by mobilizing our people but you cannot mobilize a people that is not that are largely ignorant i think that that ties into what what Sharon said about you know organizing people and but letting people to, know that, the collective good and i would like to you done. to that sorry that has to be done by educating them. A lot, we have a populace that is politically ignorant. So we have a responsibility to educate them, to raise their consciousness. Some people, do, I mean, we were on the streets August 1st. We, we protested from the underbridge to Ojota. And some people were still asking. In fact, a journalist was asking me, lawyer, what are you doing here? A journalist was asking me that. So, so the, the national I mean, consciousness... We need a is, national consciousness. I, I'd like Sean to, um, to respond to that, uh, about organizing people organizing themselves and that reorientation of sorts. I think I've said this on this show before, uh, that a nation cannot develop above the consciousness of its people. You know, our collective consciousness as Nigerians is the level of Nigeria's development. Your nation cannot rise above the consciousness of its people. You say we have a responsibility, a duty, but it's also a spiritual calling. You know, I don't like to discuss spirituality too much, but let me touch on it a bit. We Africans that are alive today are those that told our ancestors that we want to come back and fix it. I call this generation the liberation generation. It is also a spiritual calling. That's why we are restless. That's why even those of us that don't partake have to let everybody know that we don't partake. That is partaking. <laughs> you know, because the situation of African people, not only in our country, all over the world, does not sit well with us. The way it sat well with the generations before. You understand? We, the majority here, what we are missing is the understanding of that intuition. The courage to actually, because I don't like explaining what is going on. Everybody knows what is going on. And we all know what we need to do also. It is the courage and the conviction to do it, to carry it out that is lacking. We, the professionals of Nigeria, have been aligned for too long with the oppressor. Our people are ready to, they are on the verge. They want to, they want to see that we are on their side. We are the ones holding them back. It's not fear. The moment, you see, people judge musicians, you know, oh, Nigerian musicians are not singing political songs. To who? The musicians must feel like the lawyers care about justice. That the doctors care about the health of the nation. 
that the engineers are engineering and to the development of the country. That the uh, 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 educators, the professors, care about the education and the knowledge of young. Most we are also musicians will be inspired to make the music to inspire those people. So it is the professionals of this country that must change their allegiance. The bankers must stop, regardless of what your guy said. Start forming your uh, mobilizing from within these organizations. You won't know these files you are carrying to launder money is wrong. Your guy wants you to do it. Mobilize yourself. Let the people know what's going on. We are the people. Without, they can't bring their family to run all these companies and all these banks. They can't do it. They need the people. And they've not educated us enough to even have a big pool to choose from with the way the professionals are already running away safe. It's a little pool. So this will have to come to the table. This is how we begin to wrest power from them. Let us, the professionals of Nigeria, come to the side of the people. Those that have been able to get some comfort within this oppression must realize that, that comfort is not to near the oppressor. No, it's to build a bridge to your people, to pull them out of the darkness, to stand with us as a force, not because we want to dominate them, no, because we want to show them what's going on and within ourselves decide how we represent ourselves, you know. So a realignment and a national consciousness, consciousness. and that continuous engagement with government and doing what must be and done. And we have a that's national all, orientation agency. That's all we with can With billions, take. what are they doing with it? That's all we can take on this segment. Thank you, Shion Kuti, and thank you, Festa Sogun, for your contributions here on Robin Thanks Martin. for having us. Together. We'll go on a quick break. Please stay with us. I am ready for your action. Just for now, this generation, I'm talking about Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and even some millennials, there's that desire to make things quickly, to get rich really quickly. And that has led to people taking a very, very new professions that can ensure that they make this money very quickly, either through um, social media, leveraging technology. And we've seen sort of a departure. If you speak to the average Gen Z, Gen Alpha, but what they want to be, you wouldn't hear as many traditional paths like medicine, accountancy, because they don't see it as a destination to get rich very quickly. I'm joined by an HR practitioner in the person of Kelvin Ume. Welcome to Robin Minds. Thank you very much. Hope, hope you're good. I'm well. Thank you for asking. And I just want you to let me know your experience working with Gen Zers, Gen Alpha. And I will put a bit of the millennials because they are catching on very quickly to some of the trends and um, technologies available that lead to making money really fast compared to the traditional careers that you have to invest 20 years, 30 years and sure. wait for a pension. Well, you know, working with these people is very different than working with millennials, right? They, have, they, are, they, they want to get the money very quick. And then what I've noticed that one of what have really led to this is social media, right? So social media has amplified the instant money cash grab and, you know, everybody wants to get it. And over time, trust me, um, celebrities and influencers have really been, you know, posting um, affluence, um, posting luxury and success, right? they do not take the time to really tell these people the steps on how to get this done. So everybody wants to get that instant money, right? And this has really caused, you know, people to not follow the traditional means of, you know, work, you know, getting your basic education, work for some time before um, getting the money, right? Everybody just wants to dive into that quick world and they don't want to mind um, what it takes to get that money. They just want the quick money. So working with these guys have really just opened my eyes to see that in the nearest future, trust me, we might have a weak economy because not everybody is willing to do the nine to five. Um, I had someone resign the other day and I was like, just concerned to saying, why did you, why did you resign? So, oh, I'm getting more from my online, from my influence and I'm getting from work. So I want to dive fully into influencing jobs. So yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah. Is, is the goal of work just money making? What happens to fulfillment? What happens to contribution to society? Um, there are some jobs that don't pay as well, but if we should take them away, the society is finished. Let's take, for example, teaching, education. If you're not educated, even to do the online thing, to do the influencing, 
you're, you're not going to be able to, to do anything. So there are professions that need to be protected for the economy. And sure. education is just one. We still have healthcare, and I can go on and on. Agriculture, we need to eat. So where do we need to start changing people's um, understanding of the role of work in relation to society? I think um, um, not just the government. I think both influencers and celebrities and everybody needs to put their mouths together to you know, create this change. Um, today, a melan- um, I would say um, an alpha or someone you know, close to that will tell you, if you're not making money, you're not worth it. I think their, their success today, their um, glorification of success today is how much you have, what you can purchase, what properties do you have. I think if everybody, not just government, begin to invest in programs where we begin to teach these people that it is very important you work. You don't just work because you want to work. You're ho- working to help people. You're working to save the economy. You're working to save a generation to come. Then it makes it different. Because if you look at, look at what is happening around us, let's say, for instance, um, everybody in Nigeria today, we're just going to influence. And imagine what will happen to our economy. We'll have a very big skill gap. Trust me, there will be nobody doing the sewing anymore. There'll be nobody doing the teaching anymore. There'll be nobody doing, um, even the health sector is going to go down, right? So I think if we all put our voices together, like the very influencers and the celebrities they look up to, because a lot of them look deeply into social media, if we can have some segment, carve out some, some niche to begin to talk deep to saying education is important, why you want to be an influencer, you can be an influencer and still be the top teacher you are. You can be an influencer and still be the biggest doctor you want to be. You can be an influencer and still be the biggest banker you want to be. It all depends on how you set these goals. But first, education is one. And then going into that career path you want to go for yourself is the second one. When you get into that and you're doing well, you can now talk about social media, post it and, you know, talk about it. It's very allowed. Do you see that shift happening? Is it Because you can do that in Nigeria, but when you look at the West, we still see the glorification of wealth. So you're looking at your Hollywood celebrities and it's how big their house is, their mansion, how many cars they have. You're looking at your musicians and their music videos are filled with luxurious cars, the most beautiful women. So is, is it enough to just do it here in Nigeria? What happens when we still have social media, we still have the internet where people can consume this consumer-driven culture where wealth is glorified? To be honest with you, I hate to say this because I, I will tell you, and one of the ways we can really do this is by regulating social media, right? I so much believe in regulating social media. We need to look at um, consumerism. What do people even consume? Now, when we look, begin to look, in, look deep into um, influencers, um, celebrities, or even brands who put out adverts, who put out content for people to watch, and we begin to tell them you need to bring out um, reality, we don't want you, if you're going to show us the amount of mansion you have, I would also want you to give us um, time, explain how you got this, explain the number of years it took you to become this person. And I think, I think the government is the best people to really look deep into this. I think it should be regularized, right? And also look into what people consume. If it is not right for the masses, for the young people, cut it off. It shouldn't be out there. Mm. Everything about celebrity shouldn't be about um, um, ostentatious display of wealth. It shouldn't be about, um, I have 10 mansions. What are you doing? How did, how did you even get there, right? Who are the people you're bringing to ensure we, we maintain a stable economy? What is the educational um, sector is like? I think this is what people should also dive and put into, and not just the glorification of wealth, um, affluence, um, luxury, and all of those. Do, do you think these celebrities are willing to say how they really made their wealth? And I'm not talking about aspire to perspire to respire and expire. I'm talking about um, people who might have used the leverage they have to get access to make money in different ways. Um, do, do you think we're ready for that honest conversation? Um, because we, we can look at things from the traditional side of things. I mean, people who believe if I get um, what this man has said I need, I'll, he'll be able to make money for me, whether it's through ritual killings or um, some people who believe in Ponzi schemes, for example, and some people who use what they have to get um, what they want. To be honest, I don't think um, a lot of celebrities are willing to talk about that. 
because um, if you look at the, the means of income, it is not really pure. Um, and why I say this is that, um, look at what people show today on social media or on, on what we see. Oh, I got a Rolls Royce, I got a big mansion. What do you do? You know, do what, what they really do, does it equate to what they have? I think um, if the government can also look into it to saying, um, if you're able to display ostentatiously on, the, on social media, then you have to come out and declare what you have or how you got it from. Because, you know, it is really impacting this current generation and people are involved in risky behaviors. What I mean by risky behaviors, right? People don't really mind how they get this wealth. There are also a Ponzi scheme and people are into bet. Um, people are into ritual killings. I don't want to mention Godi, but you know, these are really affecting young people because nobody wants to work. You tell someone you need to work for five, six years, like to become like a manager. And it's like, why am I wasting my time to work in that long when I can do something to get instant money? Look at the youth today. A 14, 15 year old is running around with a Rolls Royce with uh, cars you know you would walk <laughs> six years to even buy those cars. People are just getting it. So I think the government should look into it. If you're going to display your wealth, tell us how you got it. And I think Simple. my final question will have to look at what others can do beyond the government. So whether it's the advertisers, whether it's the companies, whether it's the schools, um, in two minutes or less, what can the other people beyond government be doing to correct this problem? To be honest with you, I think um, it is a fight for everybody. We, we, we need to save this country. We need to save this economy because if we continue in this way, um, trust me, we're going to have a very weak workforce in years to come. It is for you as a parent, question your child, where are you getting this money from? Encourage your child to go to school. Encourage your, your child to, you know, work. Encourage them, be it one year, two years, three years. You are doing the right thing. Give them that encouragement. Give them support. Watch the kind of content they consume. Watch the friends they hang out with. As a celebrity, yes, we appreciate you displaying wealth. But as you display wealth, be able to encourage people to say, it is not easy. I worked for 10 years to be here. I, I did these brand deals to get what I have. Um, for churches, don't just collect money from people. Always advise people on the religious path to take. Tell them, you know, how important it is to live a righteous life. I'm just, just saying churches. I'm saying also, um, you know, for the mosque and other traditional means. Advise people. I think if we have like a moral standard where everybody believes in a morality, working to get things done the right way, I think there is a head part for us to go. So it's yes. a collective responsibility of government, the private sector, religious leaders, traditional leaders, celebrities, parents, and everyday people everyday like you and people, I to just people. ensure that we promote the right values exactly. around work and not glorify um, the display of wealth. Thank you exactly. very much, Kelvin, for your contributions on Thank Robin you. Minds. Thank you so much.